so here we go. Uh, looks like it's going to be a rather noisy day outside, <laughs> but potentially inside as well. Did you not get horribly wasted this weekend then? You're, you're just a bit too lively for a Monday. Yeah? Anyway, so uh, actually this lecture is titled Acoustic Quantities and it's the last really technical lecture. So we kind of wrap up the, you know, the underlying principles in the first four lectures and then we're going to have four lectures where we look at really the application of it. So most of these things will come back once more, which means that it should fall into place. And then the last two lectures will be kind of industry related in terms of acoustic consultancy and all the rest kind of giving you the outlook on a career in this direction. Uh, so in discussing acoustic quantities, I will repeat a few important things and uh, introduce quite a few new ones. Uh, there is a huge amount of quantities, things you can uh, essentially specify about the acoustic environment and about different bodies, different objects. And actually there is another huge um, amount of quantities which are psychoacoustic. Okay, so I will spend a whole lecture next week on psychoacoustics. It will be uh, the start of the theoretical bit, really, so uh, not as technical. But it will be rather important to be able to distinguish between these two and, and realize what is the forte or when, when each one of these can be used appropriately. Uh, so first and the most important thing that we've looked at already is the relationship between wavelength and frequency. Uh, so in, in essence what I'm really after is getting you guys to have a good kind of sense of things. Uh, obviously it's great if you can calculate stuff and you know turn equations any way you want them. But if we know that 343 meters per second is the speed of sound in a kind of a room environment it changes based on humidity, temperature, and such. Uh, what can we say about this 343 meters? So you see, one of the ways of really uh, getting to grips with these quantities is to think of the unit, right? So the unit of velocity here is meters per second. So if, if, if this kind of makes sense that something takes one second to go 343 meters, right? What is it that is specific about the length of 343 meters? What would be a characteristic of a hole or let's say a pipe, even simpler, a one-dimensional resonator, almost, if this pipe is 343 meters long, what would be the acoustical characteristic of it? Can you, can you connect the dots here, right? So the sound takes, in, in one second it travels 343 meters. So if I have a pipe of this length and I strike it, I didn't bring the, the, the hose, the vacuum cleaner pipe again. But if I have 343 meters long pipe, <laughs> you guys are thinking of, <laughs> I can't reach with the lighter that far, right? Uh, so, and I, and I instantiate a wave front into that pipe. It means that the wave front will reach the end of the pipe in one second, okay? What else does it mean? It means that it will reflect off the end of the pipe and it will take another second to travel back. So you can actually conclude that the resonant frequency of this pipe is how much? 
Yes? Well, actually, it is half because it has to come back as well, right? So you can, oh, there's still my drawing from last time. So actually, what you, what you imagine is that if you have a one-dimensional object, that the fundamental resonant mode, the lowest resonant mode, is this one. So actually, the length, it is double the length that would correspond to the actual period length. Okay, so I think that's, that's the kind of thing that, that is really important because actually in the uh, practical today, we will try to figure out what happens if we have one meter of path difference. Okay, so back to the story about path difference. It is the crucial way of understanding what happens with reflections. And in the simplest, most case, there is a distance between me and you. And there is the length of the, let's say, first reflection of that wall. And then the path difference is the difference between these two distances. Right? And that path difference will be crucial because if we know that this path difference is, for example, one meter, then we can conclude which frequencies will reinforce and which frequencies will attenuate. Can we do that? So if the, if the path difference is one meter, it means that in order to get my first notch, right, this one meter has to correspond to half the wavelength. Does that make sense? Because if, if, the, if the frequency is even lower, right, then we are from 180 degrees, we are actually reducing the phase uh, difference, which means that it will be progressively more in phase. And once we are down to zero path difference, it is exactly in phase, right? So that's why I'm saying when you think about these notches that arise from reflections, think about the lowest, the first notch, okay? And the first notch has to correspond to double the distance. Okay, so can we do the math here? So if I have one meter path distance, what is the thing that I can conclude? So if I have one meter, then the question is, how many seconds does it take for the wavefront to pass one meter? So if you think about the fact that it will take 343 uh, meters in one second, then one meter is one over 343 seconds, okay? So in room environment, the sound will travel one meter during 1 over 343 three seconds. What is the frequency that corresponds to this period duration of 1 over 343 three seconds? It is, uh, no, no, it is exactly 343 three hertz, right? So we are coming back to, you know, that's what you're trying to remember. If you kind of remember the units, things fall in place easier, right? So you remember that hertz is one over seconds as a unit, right? So once you get to the point that you say, well, actually, uh, in order to travel one meter, I need one over three, four, three seconds, immediately one over second gives you the hertz. So you know that is the actual <laughs> value in hertz, okay? So it is 343, but now we can also consider the fact that in order to get attenuation, destructive interference, we actually need to have a delay which is half the period, right? 
So the actual frequency where we expect the first notch is 167, something like that, hertz. Okay? So I've, you know, I, I'm kind of deliberately trying to play this in a, in a kind of a cognitive on the, on the cognitive domain. If anyone is inclined to just, you know, I actually used to study mass and physics like this, and, you know, actually before we got to do this in the mind, we were, you know, penciling around and like, okay, this swaps multiply by this, do the same thing to both sides. But because you might not have had this uh, education previously, I'm just not really pushing that side of things. So, so to be able to kind of think it through is great, but also to get these ballpark values, it's really good, right? So d don't worry if it doesn't really sink into place immediately. Okay, uh, great. Now, sound pressure level, something we've discussed. There's a few values here in terms of the values that you expect. I won't go much into this, uh, a lovely graph there as well. However, I will spend a little bit just discussing this graph because it is one of those things in terms of technical ability which is great. If you can read the title of the axis and figure out what does the graph say. Would anyone want to make an attempt here? So we're looking at adding decibels, okay? So you can assume that there are two values in decibel. Typically, we're dealing with sound source levels, okay? So we're trying to figure out if we add another sound source of a different level, what will be the result? So the vertical axis reads increment to be added to the higher level. So it is kind of uh, the, the sum will be defined by the higher dB source plus that increment. Okay, so that is my result. And on the horizontal axis, we have difference between two levels being added. Okay, so how could we read this? So let's try to add 40 dB and 50 dB using this graph. So the difference dB between two levels being added is 10 here. And this says that the increment to be added to the higher level is even less than half a dB. I kind of read 45.45. So the result is that if I add 40 dB to 50 dB, I get 50.45 dB. Okay? So that's again a kind of a mental exercise, one way. In another way, it is your ballpark skill improvement as well. And for that kind of thing, we have in acoustics what we call a 10 dB rule of thumb, which says that if you are adding sound sources, if you are adding dBs, which are less than 10 dB from the louder uh, or higher level, then you can neglect the softer sound. Okay, and that's something that comes out of this graph. So this means that if I add 40 and 50 dB, I get 50.45. If I add 19 and 100 dB, I will get 100.45. Okay, so that's your kind of developing intuition of the dBs and why they're so nice. I mean, obviously, you didn't have to calculate these things with actual Pascal which is the unit of pressure in physics. And if you did, then you would love dB. <laughs> yes? What is the 
Okay, let's see. That's a very good uh, call. So what we're saying is that 0 dB, it says 3 dB. So, so this actually has to do, it's, it's a kind of a tricky thing because it depends whether you're looking at squared magnitudes or linear magnitudes. It's a bit complicated if you're looking at power and if you're looking at pressure. And the thing is that pressure goes by 6 dB, power goes by 3 dB. And it's, it's the other thing that I've mentioned. Remember when you see the equation, you have either the 10 log of the ratio or you have the 20 log of the ratio. It's that same thing. So it's a bit of a, but very well spotted. Very, very good thinking. Kind of connect the dots immediately. Okay, so if this makes sense, right, then everything I know so far should make sense as well. Great comment there. It's just that it's a bit of a funny anomaly and in fact, I should be more precise and specify that here as well. But then again, now that you've said it, and I didn't notice myself, by the way, I'm keeping it definitely, just as a catch, you know, to see who's, who's really uh, thinking through. Okay, so we could do another few things. Well, you see that actually we have a crossing at 6-1. Okay, so that means that if I'm adding 6 dB to a source, I should say power dB, then it would be one. Okay, cool. Uh, another curve, A weighting curve. You've done bits already with A weighting. If you remember your SPL meter practical in the first teaching week, uh, you might have seen that you have the options of A curve, C curve, typically. The point is that these curves are not psychoacoustical, we will look at the psychoacoustical curve next week, but they are psychoacoustically inspired. So they're kind of really, really averaged, smoothed curves that actually have to do with how loud things appear to be. Okay, so the point is that all the dB business and all the business that I've talked about in the first class in terms of ratio between frequencies, they are closer to the way we perceive things than the linear scales, but they are not the actual way we perceive things. Right? So we have the linear scale stuff, then we have the dB scale stuff, and then there's quite a bit more to cross to psychoacoustical curves, which we will look at uh, next time. But nevertheless, it is inspired by that. It's supposed to relate to how loud we consider things to be in relation to the actual power of the, or I should say, acoustical energy, maybe. Okay? And then the point to understand then is that we actually need to pump much more energy in bass frequencies in order to hear them to be equally loud as some mid, mid frequencies, typically. Okay, so therefore you, you see all these huge woofers and huge amps on woofers and much less of an issue with mids, okay? Uh, because it's a curve like this, well, you can just read it out, but typically you won't be facing this too much. Okay, now I've briefly mentioned the three levels that you might want to be aware of in acoustics. So SPL, sound pressure level, uh, has to do with the receiver with the pressure at the receiver, with the loudness, you could say, with the level at the receiver. And then sound power, okay, has to do with the source. So the sound power level describes what is the characteristic of the source. And if you want to go from the characteristic of source to the characteristic of the receiver or at the receiver, then it is interesting to note that you need to take into account neighboring boundaries. Okay, so that's something you probably understood already and actually I've mentioned it as well. Here is in the equation just so you see, first of all that there is such thing in sound power level, okay, and sound pressure level just so you know that you might get confused 
and SPL sound pressure level is typically the only thing you will face. Nevertheless, it might be the other way around. And it's interesting to note that you can translate between these two may the, may the need arise. But it's also quite crucial to understand that if I measure an SPL, which will characterize the acoustic energy at a receiver, I actually don't really know much about the source. Okay? If I know the distance to the source, I am a step closer. But actually, to be more precise, I need to know the boundaries that might be near the source. And you see that's a graph that shows you how, in fact, if you have a free field, as we call it in acoustics, so you have no boundaries nearby, then you will get a higher or a lower SPL at the receiver in the free field. Yes? No. Lower. Okay, so why? Well, because the acoustic energy spreads in all possible directions. Okay, so if you have this source on a surface, then the acoustic energy will spread in the semisphere, hemisphere, not in the full sphere, right? So you will have more acoustical energy in front, obviously, not behind the boundary. And then worth adding here is that it is assumed that these boundaries are fully reflective. Okay, so, and then the interesting thing, if you have it in one corner or in the kind of a corner corner, then the math goes up as well. And in fact, if you do, if you're kind of getting friendly with dB, you can just figure out the difference in dB from, uh, just from the Q, from the directivity factor. Not necessarily... Uh, relevant. Okay, so here we have uh, decay with distance. Um, not much to be said about this one. It's a bit of a recap, as I said, in terms of the important technical underlying uh, facts. 6 dB rule. Okay, that's your 6 dB rule. Doubling the distance, you drop 6 dB. Uh, and this is the graph that corresponds. Shall we check the graph, make sure it does make sense? So what it's saying that if I'm here at 5 meter, I have minus 25 dB, which means that at 10 meter, I should have 6 less, and it does come out at minus 31. <coughs> so this graph looks all right so far. Okay, worth noting that I kind of started the whole course with talking about the assumptions of uh, point source and point receivers and how this largely influences the you know the accuracy of things we're doing because there are no point source and point receivers but these are necessary terms for us to be able to do any basic maths with acoustics uh, so once you get to you know, understand the, the relationships uh, that arise from having uh, point sources in rooms. Uh, the next step, well, there, there's things with dipole sources and monopole sources. Uh, hello. So just so you have some, I don't know, some um, intuition on where this will go, can go, right? So you have a point source, a monopole, is the one that kind of pulsates like a sphere, and the dipole is the one that moves back and forth, okay, a bit like, uh, like a piston. Piston is a big, big chapter in basic acoustics, if you get there. Um, and they have rather different acoustical characteristics. You might have heard of dipole speakers, anyone? So those are speakers that only have the front baffle, they, they're not the, the rear of the speaker is not in an enclosure. There are such things. Um, okay, so just the kind of scratching the, the, the surface of, uh, of acoustics, monopole, dipole, and then line source is another uh, concept which uh, allows you to calculate a few things. In kind of entry-level architectural acoustics, 
maybe guys from Acoustics will talk about this, I'm not sure, but there are slightly different equations and ways of considering a highway, right, in relation to considering a factory or a building site or something like this in terms of how you calculate things, what are the levels expected. But actually, just before the lesson, I was going through these slides and I've removed the equation uh, just to save uh, some brain space. Okay, uh, next one up, we have reverberation time and we've already discussed it briefly. Okay, so uh, you should remember that the reverberation time as an acoustic quantity, as a unit, is something that we mark with T60. And that 60 index subscript indicates the type of reverberation time unit. And in acoustics, as you will see uh, today, we have a lot of units which have the additional subscript that say a bit more about what we've actually measured. So T60 is your duration of time that the acoustic energy drops 60 dB in, I guess. And then you would have the T30 as well, right? And we actually have the T10, which is EDT. I'll talk about that in a second. So what it is then is a way of specifying reverberation time with the additional information in terms of what is the drop in level during this amount of time. Okay, I don't know if this makes things uh, more or less confusing. The interesting thing to note is that normally if you measure reverberation time with loud impulsive sound sources, which is one of your options, like balloons and uh, start pistols and things like this. Probably come up with something on the building site as well uh, for this purpose. Then typically the background noise, again, is such that you can't really measure well the 60 dB drop because the sound drops into the noise floor, so to speak. So typically what you do is you measure the T30 and then you double that, okay? Now this is an assumption, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, in any case, when you try to measure reverberation time with an impulsive sound, actually what you're doing is you're measuring the reverberation time such that the spectrum of the impulsive sound is determinant in terms of which frequencies you're measuring, which reverberation frequencies are you measuring. It's not a great way of putting it. But th this actually leads me to, I don't have a slide on this, because it's kind of uh, supposed to be there in APDI, which I understand not everyone takes anymore. Maybe I should be putting a slide on convolution. Okay, so. Convolution is a really lovely and tricky beast in signal processing and in acoustics. And what it does, you probably know, you've heard the term in relation to reverberation algorithms, I imagine. So what it does, it applies reverb. Okay, so that's, that's really a kind of entry level intuitive thing. What is convolution? It is the application of reverb or resonance okay so i can do the same thing with the guitar body okay so i can kind of swap the guitar bodies out by doing convolution with different bodies so what do i convolve with i convolve with the impulse response so i've talked briefly about impulse response right and how it exhaustively describes linear time invariant systems and for all purposes acoustic responses are uh, linear and time invariant so actually we can measure a room with an impulse response what is inaccurate about the statement that I've just uttered I repeat I said 
using an impulse response I can measure a room yes exactly so what would be an accurate way of putting this well in fact if 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 we you know stretch it a bit well the, the microphones we are using are fairly flat but we don't have proper in, in fact by the way if anyone wants to we do have a dodecahedron loudspeaker the omni speaker which is there to make more accurate acoustical measurements it's just that we don't have six of them and they're clumsy uh, but if we say have the calibration file for the microphone and for, for the speaker what then what does the impulse response do does it then measure the room ideas the telephone will tell you or is that a Tamagotchi <laughs> feed it feed it what then so we have the calibration files am I then getting the room measured with an impulse response yes or no no I'm sh yes yes I could get an average if I do many so in, in order to put this very accurately what I would say then is that I'm measuring the source receiver relationship within a room okay so the position of the source and receiver is also rather important obviously the characteristics so that's why I've taken in the calibration files so we can kind of forget about those but the position is crucial as you've heard right last week you were walking around rooms where we had standing waves and it was a surprise how how strong the effect is how you can actually find a spot in the room where you can hardly hear it in fact you find a spot in the room where you hear that the low frequencies is gone you just hear the harmonics of it <coughs> funny things okay so convolution okay we've approached it now with from a few kind of different ways entry level intuitive approaches the technical thing, if you like to remember uh, uh, a verse, if you have a math rock band, it might be a good lyric as well. Convolution is multiplication between spectral magnitudes. Okay, so th that's another thing that I would love to spend some time with, but then again, not here hopefully you've had some uh, studies of FFT fast Fourier transform spectral analysis so one thing the reason why I said magnitudes is because what is frequently overlooked is that when you measure a spectrum you don't just get the magnitude spectrum you also get the phase spectrum and in fact it's quite curious that if I do this I have I, I saw some of you guys doing max MSP so you can actually try this as well so you take your FFT and you get two signals you get the magnitude and you get the phase and just do the simplest thing of making all the magnitude 0 0.5 and keep the phase signal and then the other thing where you make all the phase values fix 0 0.5 and keep the magnitude signal the surprising thing is that if you zero out all the magnitudes right so you actually get a flat spectrum you will still likely recognize the sound source understand if it was speech and so on so in a way we we are kind of inclined to think that most of the interesting stuff is in the magnitude spectrum and the phase spectrum is being thrown out what's the term there baby with the water something like this you throw out the baby with the bath water maybe it's from a different language <laughs> anyway um, so the point is that there is a huge amount of information in phase 
And you can kind of get there just by thinking it through. Let's say that you have one bin at 100 hertz and the other one at 200, right? So you have bins which are spaced equally, and then you have a 150 hertz sign come through. You see? So actually, the funny thing is that if you have that analysis of 150 hertz sine wave, you will get 100 and 200 hertz bins high in magnitude. But the way that this can be resynthesized is through the fact that in the phase there is something which allows the 150 hertz to be reconstructed. Wow. What is it? You interested in this? I, I might have gone too far. But you guys were so lively on a Monday morning. I have to kill you just that little bit, I guess. <coughs> morning? Did I say morning? Great. So, <coughs> so you see, actually, if I have a bin, a magnitude bin at 100 hertz and at 200 hertz, they're both high up. What's happening is that in the phase, you see, the phase is, so to speak, the time delay. If the phase is progressively growing, then I'm actually progressively delaying it, thereby progressively stretching it, and thereby getting a lower frequency than the magnitude bin. That's, I'm stopping right now, okay? But that's just a bit about magnitude and phase and FFT because it's a lovely thing to understand uh, fully. In fact, I have, I have a lecture on Wednesday on the around sound, and I was thinking to do uh, probabilistic metronomes I was thinking to do subharmonic distortion, but actually now that I'm thinking about this, maybe I should just do FFT, because there's a definite two-hour lecture on FFT that you guys didn't really have, I imagine. You probably had a little bits and bobs and SDA relates to it and APDI related, to it, I related, to it. but to truly understand how uh, FFT works is a, I'm getting goosebumps already. Uh, because it's not a filter bank. Okay, so th the way pro you can probably imagine some spectral analysis at this stage is, well, you kind of isolate different spectral regions, right? Filtering, filter banks. But no, FFT is not a filter bank, which makes it that much more exciting in terms of understanding how on earth could you ever distinguish between different spectral components. Uh, I think I'll do it. I think I'll do an FFT talk on Wednesday. It's probably the most exciting and most pertinent thing anyway. So come to that if you are interested. So yeah, th the reason I went all the way there was uh, convolution, which is the multiplication of magnitude spectra. So what does that mean? I this is a spectrum. So if I clap, or this is a gunshot, if I produce this sound in a room, then what I will get in terms of spectrum is this shape multiplied with the shape of the room. What does the multiplication do? Well, one thing you probably know that if you multiply with zero, it is zero. If you multiply two signals between zero and one with each other, then essentially what you're doing is that if both signals are one, you will get a one. So the peak stays true peak, so to speak. If you have zeros, they stay zero. But halfway, if you multiply half with half, it will become a quarter. So you're kind of doing it, doing a kind of a, you could call it a compression type thing where all the middle is kind of compressed down to the bottom. So if you're multiplying magnitude spectra, what you actually get is uh, spectral components, only those spectral components which were present in both signals. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of doing a rough description here, but that's probably uh, good enough, which means that if this room, let's say, has a huge notch at 100 hertz, no matter how much 100 hertz I pop into it, it won't come through. 
Okay? So it's that kind of relationship. It needs to be in both terms in order to survive the convolution. Okay? So actually that's why ideally you would do an impulse response measurement with a flat signal. And here comes the really exciting thing. The fact that the FFT of the impulse response, right? So the time signal, which follows a clap, is your spectral response. And the inverse FFT, so the synthesis of a spectrum, will give you the time domain impulse response. So actually there is a back and forth path between impulse response and spectra. Yeah, and the convolution is in there. So that's just this, a few important terms in, in, in terms of the signal processing here. But f for our purposes here in acoustics, it is important that, you know, if there is a notch in the room, I can't really create that spectral component. Or if in the signal there is a notch, then that mode of the room will never be excited. Okay, so it really needs to be present on both sides in order to survive convolution. And convolution is your multiplication of spectra or indeed the application of resonance, so to speak. Okay, cool. Taken quite a bit with this. Never mind. I hope you're enjoying it. So far, so good. I normally sense when it's too late. <laughs> Okay, so I won't go too much deeper into reverb because we will discuss it in practice. I talked a bit about EDT, early decay time. Uh, okay. Uh, now, the interesting thing about reverb, actually, one of the really interesting things is that it can go both ways. So it is not necessarily a linear decay on a log plot in time. And this will tell you a lot about the characteristic of the room. So for now, let it just, you know, live its own life in the back of your brain, and then we will discuss it once we get to recording rooms. Okay, fairly straightforward. In terms of suitability of reverberation times, this is more something that will come once we get to the architectural side of things. But something that you might imagine already is that it is important that the room is dry if you want to hear a lot of detail. Kind of uh, works out easily, I guess. And then next week all the psychoacoustic stuff will, will add to this. Uh, okay, now the reason why we're uh, doing this is because we are trying to get to the term clarity. So in terms of recording studios, we will discuss this later on. Schools, that's architectural stuff, bit of a reference. Interesting thing is that this comes uh, with uh, concert halls, because the interesting thing is that depending on the size of the room you're in, you have a different expectation. And you can fool yourself quite easily. Right? So if you if you you know if you're in a very large hall so you could you could probably do this so you can play an oralization. Oralization is that a term you guys know? It should be have been heard. Oralization is your way of oralizing or kind of creating um um uh, a simulation of a room, so to speak. So probably once the Mac acoustic guys come in, they will briefly mention this. It is what you do to, you know, clients. The, they give you a million and then you say, okay, well now you can listen to the way that the room will sound once it's built or something like this. And it's largely an approximation. So what I was coming to is that if you have a visual experience of a huge room and a visual experience of a small room, 
then you will judge the same oralization differently. Okay, it, it has to do, I think I've mentioned about walking around buildings with a recorder and listening to the tape while you're talking to it to realize that the acoustic environment changes hugely and we don't notice it. So there is always a compensation because we are a kind of an anomaly seeking awareness. So if there is no anomaly, we don't notice it. And the point is that we have this huge amount of psychoacoustic expectation built into the perception. So a lot of things go unnoticed. And this is one of the interesting graphs that supports this, that actually you have to figure out the reverberation time in relation to the room size, to the whole size for it to be natural. So it, it, it is not an isolated parameter, so to speak. Okay, uh, early sound, late sound. Uh, it's a kind of an arbitrary uh, boundary there, but there is a whole lot of interest, interest in it. And I've talked a bit about it when I discussed the reflections. So I won't go into this just now. Oh, this slide has just repeated itself, I realize. Okay, I'll clean that up. Um, what I'm trying to get to, I did clean this up, bloody hell. Uh, what I'm trying to get to is clarity. Okay, so now we're gonna talk in the last maybe 20 minutes, 15 if you really can't cope, or I drop dead. Uh, some acoustical quantities which you might not or you are unlikely to have heard of before. And they are quantities, they have units, it's a bit like physics, so to speak. Clarity is one of them, and it does what it's supposed to, it's supposed to tell us how much of clarity a certain room has in terms of audition. Okay, so how clearly do I hear different sources in this or that room? And you've seen already one graph which did something with the uh, reverb tails, which suggested that if there is a huge amount of reverb, then the events that follow each other after a short duration of time won't be necessarily audible if the later one is softer and so on. So you can kind of imagine these things. Now, the thing is that uh, clarity is then used as a unit in acoustics and we have two types, two famous types, C80 and C50, okay? So, and the index, the subscript there indicates the amount of milliseconds which should be the boundary b between early and late sound. And the thing to know is that the early sound is crucial, but it's not just the direct sound. Okay, so here there is potentially some room to expand your understanding of acoustics. In fact, this is one of the really crucial things, is that very early reflections, they improve the clarity of the sound. Okay, so I don't know if any one of you has uh, played with an orchestra or you probably with the band on stage you may have you may have not had the opportunity to you know be in a situation where you just don't hear the band or you don't hear the orchestra and then they just place a reflector behind you and you suddenly hear them so organizing early reflections on stage is crucial and if you if you look at uh, concert halls, which you will look at potentially with Bruce in a few weeks' time, you will see that very frequently you will have a very well-designed set of reflectors on the stage for the musicians to hear each other. And that's the crucial thing. So if uh, a reflection is early, it makes the sound source more audible, audible in more detail. If the reflection is late, then it does not. Okay? Now, so the point of clarity is that you get a ratio between early 
and late uh, reflection energy in the room. Okay. And as it makes sense, right? So if it is, if the clarity is supposed to be higher, right? It means that the early reflections are louder. So the early on top of late. Okay, proportion, inverse proportion, that kind of story. And then the 10 log just to get the dB and all the rest. By the way, if you do, do not have the sum of pressures, but you have dB there already, it is much simpler. I won't go into this. The point is that the index, the AT, is for music. So we have clarity for music. And the C50 is the clarity for speech. <coughs> so the spectral undulations of speech are much more rapid. Especially if you speak Spanish, for example. <laughs> okay, so actually one way of me counteracting the characteristic of the room and the higher noise floor is that I am trying to speak slightly more spaciously, so to speak. I kind of pull the articulation apart. I try to make it a slower undulation. Okay? Because that makes the speech more intelligible. And the interesting thing is then that the intelligibility of speech has higher requirements compared to the music. The nice thing is that you will see the room EQ wizard just spits out your clarity. Okay, so you don't have to do the math, but it's important to understand that this is a unit or, or sorry, a quantity that we will relate to. Here is a little graph of this. So you have the integral, uh, and it's not flower. Uh, so it is the kind of the sum of things, so to speak. Integral is essentially your surface under the graph. Uh, bit of math relationships there if you're interested and this is what you're actually doing in terms of determining clarity you're looking at early reflections you're looking at late reflections you're summing them all and then you're looking at the ratio of the two and that's how you get your clarity I think that should be fairly straightforward there we go okay now in terms of speech intelligibility by the way uh, speech related signal processing and acoustics is huge it, it was kind of the most prominent development direction in the 60s 70s maybe even 80s scientists kind of got a hold of speech as being a crucial thing to understand and a lot of acoustics is, and signal processing is built around speech uh, so there's quite some interesting stuff uh, there, here's something funny, I guess you've read that. Uh, in terms of speech, we have the clarity, the C50, which can be a measure of suitability for speech transmission. But actually we have the speech transmission index, which is slightly more complex, but it's worth discussing because it gives you another perspective an, another method of measuring stuff. So the way the speech transmission index is measured is that you're looking at the modulation depth. Okay, so the idea is that in order to understand speech, I have to have a sufficient dynamic range to get the soft bits and the loud bits. So what you can then do is you can create a test signal which has a huge dynamic range and then you take that single through a room and then you look at the output and you look at the change of this dynamic range and typically the dynamic range will uh, be compressed will be smaller and then the degree of this will be your speech transmission index and then the interesting thing is that you can tune this signal, this test signal, to be akin to speech. You see, so the frequencies there would be from 0.6 to 12.45 hertz, because those are the frequencies that correspond to undulations in speech. Right? 
So if I say something really quickly, then maybe I've hit the kind of 10, 12 hertz, which means 10, 12 undulations per second. Okay? And if I say something, maybe it took more than a second to have that longer undulation, that slower articulation, and thereby I've gone just below one hertz. Okay? So that's how you create the modulation, the amplitude modulation signal. And then also what you can do is amplitude modulate a noise band which is characteristic of speech. Right? So you're kind of approaching the speech in two different ways and making it statistically similar. Essentially, you're making a test signal which is statistically similar to the speech, right? In terms of the spectral content, in terms of undulations. And then you take it through the room and you get the compression of dynamic range and you call that speech transmission index, the ratio of the two. So you look at the modulation depth and so on. Okay, so that's a bit about that. This is what you get in terms of uh, expectation. It's possible that Mac acoustic people will mention it. So just so you had some preparation. You know, typically if we were to classify the suitability of this room for lecturing, we would want to measure speech transmission index. And as if you've seen, to do it, you are actually, again, looking at source receiver positions within the room. And if you change these positions, you get different results. So you can do a kind of average, or you can do something which is really pertinent where you have a single source and you have multiple receiver positions. That could work as well. Okay, next one up. Early lateral energy fraction. Yoo-hoo! So this is uh, an acoustical quantity Actually, by the way, can you guys help me? Am I supposed to say acoustic quantity or acoustical quantity? I find myself, you know, doing things back and forth. Every year I'm revising the slides. I'm like, I think it's acoustic. And then for two years it's acoustic. And then after it's acoustical, it probably doesn't make a huge difference, does it? So this is a quantity that tells us something about envelopment. Okay, so this is a quantity which was developed as the science of concert halls has developed, which is a big chunk of early acoustics. Um, and what it does, it actually gives us a ratio. Again, it's a kind of an energy ratio, just like the clarity. But this time, it is not between early and late sound. It is between omni sound, so all of the sound, and the lateral sound, which is the side coming sideways okay so it is as you might expect something that will tell you whether you feel enveloped by sound which means that there is a lot coming from the sides or you don't which means that things seem to come from the source only right and as you imagine feeling enveloped in a concert hall is a desired outcome however the interesting thing here is that if you have a very reverberant hall, you will definitely get more lateral energy, but you are losing clarity. Uh -huh. So that's, that's how these things have been designed anyway, is to see that, you know, how, how, wh what are the trade-offs? You see, so you, you may say, well, actually, I want uh, an extremely rich enveloping hall, Okay, and you can push it, but watch out because you're going to lose the clarity and you suddenly won't hear the trills or some kind of ornamentation in the music because the clarity is lost to it. And, and that's essentially what people are doing with designing calls at the stage of kind of estimating different quantities, you know, figuring out the trade-offs. Um, Okay, so the nice thing about this is that you can just set up two microphones and measure it. Okay, if you have a figure of eight microphone, you have an omni microphone, set up the two of those, get an SPL of both of these, and you can get to your lateral energy. Again, in a certain room, 
in a certain source receiver configuration. Okay, only a few more guys, we're almost there. So what we have as another, now we're getting more into the uh, architectural acoustics or uh, environmental acoustics uh, domain, and they have a few interesting quantities worth knowing of. First one is equivalent sound level, to put this long term short, that's how we typically abbreviate it. And it is not much more than just an average of your SPL. So you've already seen in Room EQ Wizard and probably elsewhere that on top of all these varied things, you always have the smoothing factors. And actually, if you play with the smoothing factor, it's a bit like statistics. You can prove any point you want. You know, so, and so if you see uh, a spectral response of a speaker and it doesn't state the smoothing factor, then you know it's done by marketing people. If you see the smoothing factor stated, and in fact, if the line is rather j crazy up and down, then you know, well, it was done by engineers. So the smoother the curve, <laughs> the, the more money there was in the marketing, right? That's what they take the money for. I'll, I'll make your product more, more sellable for a million. And then I just go around and just smooth out all your curves. And there you go. And, and remove the off-axis response, by the way. Because on-axis response, in fact, it's horrible. Because what you get most of the time is that speaker manufacturers would tune the speaker to have as flat as possible on-axis response, which means just straight in front of the speaker, and sacrifice the off-axis response, because we're not going to show you the graph anyway. And this makes for a horrible speaker, because all the off-axis disbalance in spectrum is very much audible, because you are in an enclosure, you're in a room. Okay? You're not in an anechoic chamber. So essentially, very frequently, they're tuning stuff to look perfect in an anechoic chamber. And then, you know, the marketing will solve the rest. You know, you're just going to buy it anyway. So really, we'll really pay attention. There are a few manufacturers. And if you go into the graphs and you're like, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now they're talking off axis, on axis, everything. So, so watch out for that. Uh, now, back to equivalent sound level curve. It's a bit of a simple one. It is a bit of a smoothing thing. Here it is. You have a blue line, which was your SPL measurement, and then equivalent sound level is the red line. Nothing uh, much uh, to say about this. The interesting thing is it has a kind of a, a decay time, which is long, to put it in plug-in users terms uh, it, it will stick high so to speak right because you're, you're kind of trying to get to some kind of average nuisance but actually it's not very good at that as I will show you later uh, the other lovely way of looking at SPL curves is to look at 90 percentile okay so this is a a term from statistics it's worth knowing uh, what it does what it does it discards 10% of the data okay so it is the kind of measurement which says I allow 10% of the time to be the anomaly and I'm not gonna take it into my average so it's a kind of an averaging approach with uh, with, uh, with just 10% ditch out of the window. And the reason why this works well for background sound level is that you, know, you will have 10% of the time an actual anomaly which does not relate to the background sound level. Right? So it's quite interesting. So the building site here, right? at this stage, all these sounds would be caught in the background level estimation because they're fairly continuous. But if we just had, you know, one lorry crossing or maybe if, if we were near the airport, right, 
and we would have one really loud event every 40 minutes, then it wouldn't be caught by this type of averaging because it would be the 10% anomaly that gets thrown out with the baby water, baby with the water, something like that. <laughs> Okay, so it's, it's that kind of measurement where you discard the anomaly. And again, the index there, the 90 could change, right? So you can take an 80 percentile measurement, you can take a 95, which again determines, your percentile determines how much you're willing to call an anomaly. And here is the description of how this looks like, uh, or a graph. So you see, this is my SPL curve. And then if you take L90, right, then you actually get really neatly down to the background level. You see, so all of this, actually, I, I've, I've said it the other way around, I'm sorry. So actually what you get is that the 90% of the loudest stuff gets discarded, which is a bit the other way around from the percentile. But in any case, that's the, that's the basic understanding in terms of the background level measurement that you're actually discarding these uh, loud things. You're trying to get to the background level, okay? Then we also have a weighted maximum sound level, which is a way of uh, estimating what is the loudest thing happening. Uh, I'm not sure you will encounter many of these in future, but it's, it's worth knowing. Uh, typically, what you also have with these SPL-related measurements is uh, time weighting, so you get fast or slow. You remember on the SPL meter probably as well, you had the fast and slow. Okay, so that's again a kind of a smoothing thing. This is typically what the values would be. And this, this is the informative thing here. If you, if you get this, then you kind of get the three funny things. So the three funny things are the equivalent level, okay? We have the background 90 percentile level, and we have the maximum levels, okay? So what you see then is that typically your background noise estimation is the lowest of the three graphs. The other thing you see, this is a 24-hour traffic recording, okay? So it actually works very neatly to describe, to distinguish day from night. So no matter the fact that there are much less cars at night, right? But there are cars, you, you actually get the estimation which shows you the background level, right? If you look at the max level, Right? You see it is the highest one of the three, fairly obvious, and it actually catches those anomalies when, I don't know, probably uh, an ambulance car passes or something like this. But then you see that both top graphs, they actually get really messy at night. You see, because th they can't really cope with the fact that you get a car coming every three, four minutes. So it, it kind of catches, catches the undulation. It doesn't smooth it out. All right, I think that's about that. So uh, have a break and uh, go to the respective rooms and everything is on Blackboard and I'll just walk past and uh, help you with the stuff. <laughs>